if you really trace the history here, neoconservatism was an evolution from an older version of conservatism that was opposed to the rise of the American nanny state. So here you got to really understand the history. A lot of the regulatory state in the nanny state and the entitlement state and the muscular form of government, that came out of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. This actually came out in last week's episode of the podcast, which if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to, was my conversation with Christopher Caldwell. He's the author of a great book called The Age of Entitlement. But he's laid out the way in which the 1960s, according to him, with the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson, comprised effectively a kind of second constitutional convention in America, a second kind of rebargaining of what are actual rights and substantive negative rights, but also positive rights are as Americans in ways that came at attention with the original constitution, including it up to the four, first and 14th amendments. But since then, you traded off your sovereignty for stuff. You got a bunch of stuff, Medicaid, welfare, et cetera, but you got a regulatory state that impeded your sovereignty since then. That was the original sin as he sees it, and I agree with this, in the 1960s. The conservative response to that was to say that we wanna shut down that entitlement state, that regulatory state, that entire nanny state. That used to be the classical conservative response, was to say that we don't want to replace this left-wing nanny state with a right-wing nanny state. It would be unthinkable. It wouldn't even make sense. There's no such thing as a right-wing nanny state. It's an oxymoron on its own terms in this classical 1960s, 1970s conservative response. But that was where it began. The neoconservatives, actually, you want to talk about neocons, the real neocons were those that through the 1990s and 2000s, went soft on that, actually, through compassionate conservatism, through George Bush era conservatism, and said, wait a minute, okay, we're going to effectively accept the existence of the state. A lot of that's here to stay, but we want to run government efficiently. Okay, we're not going to dismantle the regulatory state. We're not really going to take aim at the entitlement state. None of that's going to change anyway. Let's at least make sure that it's run efficiently. Oh, and while we're at it in terms of accepting the permanence of a certain level of, if not giant government, at least bigger, medium-sized government, we might as well use that to spread democracy around the world through our foreign interventionism in places like Iraq. It actually kind of made sense, which in turn actually reinforced the welfare state, by the way. The more you expand the warfare state, the more you necessarily have to expand the welfare state, because if you invade the rest of the world and cause a lot of chaos, you invite them in. That's why, and I talked about this last week with Christopher Caldwell as well, that's why a lot of the invasions in Iraq and other parts of the Middle East where we've tinkered around are now costing Europe in the form of its mass migration and even the mass migration crisis to the US. But it's a certain sense in which that neoconservative vision actually hung together based on saying that we're accepting a certain level of the state existing, but we're just gonna use it kind of at least efficiently to some of the right ends, manage it, curb it around the edges from just getting too big, but not really trying to shave it down. And while we're at it, let's go invade some other countries. That was actually the neoconservative view. 